Hello, everybody. Uh, great to meet you. Uh, let's start right away with, with our topic um, about predictive maintenance. So if you uh, look at the unplanned downtime we have in the industry, um, and on an annual basis, we can see that more than 50 billion a year is uh, wasted on uh, unplanned downtimes, and it's affecting almost all industries. A car manufacturer is losing 1.3 million an hour if a manufacturing plant is uh, offline, um, an airplane provider uh, loses 10,000 uh, an hour if an airplane cannot, cannot fly. And uh, a very important for all of us nowadays, uh, the pharmaceutical and healthcare industry, they are losing 20 billion a year because of uh, unplanned downtime. Um, this can be highly improved by predictive maintenance uh, use cases and systems. And uh, just a, a couple of examples here uh, outside the manufacturing industry. So some, for some of the industry like the uh, wind park industry, it is very important to plan the maintenance, the maintenance schedules uh, really in a very uh, consistent and accurate way uh, to, avoid, uh, to avoid costs. But uh, predictive maintenance is also um, uh, an improvement in customer satisfaction. Um, to avoid delays and cancellation in the air, um, airplane um, industry is also uh, a big decrease with, is, with customer satisfaction. And uh, even in a non-manufacturing environment like a fleet operations management and operation, you need to meet uh, SLAs. Um, and based on that, predictive maintenance can also play a very important role in, in that industry. And, and of course, in the manufacturing industry, uh, all the uh, breakdowns and, uh, and hazards um, in the manufacturing plants, uh, in the automotive industry, but in almost all manufacturing industry, is, um, it, it can highly be um, improved with predictive maintenance. So let's spend uh, two minutes on where the current maintenance approach uh, looks like in the industry uh, today. So <clears throat> there are basic, basically four levels of um, maintenance approaches and status available. That's a study from Deloitte. And uh, the level one is uh, saying, and this is established in more than 50 years, uh, based on visual inspection. So it's, it's manual, it's, it's scheduled. And the interesting thing is that more than 25% still today are on this level one uh, maintenance approach. Um, it improved over the time to level two, uh, which is uh, supported by tools and assisted by, by uh, instruments. But it is still a manual process to do the, uh, uh, the maintenance inspection. And it is more than 40% currently uh, still on that um, maintenance level in the industry. Um, an improvement is level three, which is uh, already monitoring the equipment uh, in the field in uh, real time. Um, but most of these systems are uh, rule-based and condition-based. And, is, and it is in all of the cases a reactive um, situation. 20% um, of the industry uh, having that, but um, also level three is not doing any kind of predictive, predictive uh, maintenance use cases. So the goal should be from now on and in the future to move to level four, which is uh, called predictive maintenance. And Predictive maintenance, uh, we think, is only possible with uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence because we need to predict the future. Uh, and if you establish a predictive maintenance system, you can expect um, an overall equipment effective effectiveness of more than 90%, which is uh, much better than all the uh, levels below. Um, also interesting, only 11% right now in the industry are using predictive maintenance systems. Uh, so there is, there is a way to go here. Um, from a value perspective, uh, what, can, what kind of values you can uh, get from predictive maintenance systems? The obvious one is to reduce the downtime of uh, systems and equipment. That can be reduced by up to 50%, um, which is already a great improvement, but this is just one value area you can improve. Uh, in some industry, it's very uh, costly 
to do the maintenance um, not at the right time. So if you do a maintenance uh, too, too early, it is also a massive um, cost attached to that. And this predictive maintenance, you can also improve your overall maintenance costs uh, related to that by 30%. Uh, the third value area is also uh, um, related to maintenance schedules. If you have a more accurate prediction of the uh, needed uh, maintenance, you can get rid of some of the uh, already scheduled repairs. And this is about 12% reduction possible. And finally, uh, if something goes really wrong and the equipment is, is broken, is damaged, it's as a breakdown, uh, your equipment, and it depends a little bit on how expensive your equipment is, but in all cases, there's also an expense, a cost attached to the, to the destroyed uh, product. Um, so, and this has already a huge impact on, on, uh, on costs and expenses and your business, but the challenge is getting even more uh, complicated and more important because there is an estimate that there will be an explosive growth of uh, IoT devices in the next couple of years. Uh, 27, there will be 40 billion IoT devices and that uh, needs to be managed. And the most important uh, use case and, um, and driving that IoT adoption is uh, predictive maintenance. So uh, therefore the, uh, the challenge is, is getting more complicated and even more important than it is today. And to give you a more detailed understanding what predictive maintenance really is and how you can solve it with AI, I will hand over to Ashka. Well, thank you, Ralph. Uh, first, before we move on, let's define what really predictive maintenance is. So the essence of predictive maintenance is being able to answer to the following four questions. Whether something's gonna fail. So that would be the first question we wanna know. If something's gonna fail, so the next thing that we wanna know is that what will fail. When we know what will fail, the next thing that we wanna know, when it's going to happen. It's gonna happen in the next two days or next two years. So depending on the answers, we need to apply a different strategy. And then the last thing that we want to know is why will it fail? The answering the first uh, three questions probably, you know, immediately clear why we need the answer to this question. But the fourth one, I'm going to come also later, why it's critical and crucial to know the answer to these questions. So um, basically, answering these questions is the core part of predictive maintenance. And how it's done typically is as the following. In a nutshell, the process is as the following. You will observing your equipment. Um, it, it could be a marine construction equipment if you're in offshore industry or uh, a turbofan or, or in robot in production line in manufacturing, for example. It doesn't matter. The principle is more or less the same. And that is you need to collect um, you know, some sort of data set that mainly it would be uh, sensor data or it, if it has a rotating part or moving part you want to look into, for example, vibration or uh, you know, even taking images of a couple of uh, location or parts of your components. So the next thing that you would like to do after collecting this data is processing this data in order to be able to predict or estimate remaining useful life of your components. So that's the nutshell. So when you know that, you know, what is the remaining useful life of your component, if it's short, then you probably want to trigger a maintenance um, in order to avoid the breakdown, or even if you have an expensive equipment to make sure that they are not running out of spec. All right, so what are the steps to be done in order to accomplish such a process or implement such a solution? Let's look at a hypothetical example, and that would be like, you know, I'm observing here, imagine one of my equipment or one of my asset, and that would be the timeline. And the observation point starts somewhere here. Everything at the beginning is healthy, healthy, and somewhere down the line is going to fail. So what I want to avoid is that failure to happen and to fix things. I mean, sometimes I might be okay with that. For example, your bulb light um, at home, it's okay. Let's fail and you'll fix it. I can leave with that. 
one thing that we cannot live with is if that's an engine of an airplane that carrying 200 people. So we, we want to make sure that we are able to predict that prior to that, or at least maintain that before this happened. And actually, what's the fun fact here is that before 60s, that was the standard way to do the maintenance, let it fail, then fix it. And after 60s, uh, they realized that that's costly, it, that, that has a hazard to uh, you know, personnel and also environment. They started to do a preventive maintenance, which means you would do um, maintenance prior to it happens. And because we don't know answer, or we didn't know the answer before that when it's going to happen, this failure is going to happen, they started to do you know, frequent maintenance before it happened. So most of those maintenance were unnecessary, but because we don't know when going to fail, we wanted to do that as frequent as possible. But indeed, the most effective way to do the maintenance is prior to that event, also before the lead time that that maintenance required, exactly at this point of time, so that you avoid a breakdown and also unnecessarily cost that this repetitive unnecessary maintenance that imposes if you have done scheduled uh, maintenance. So at that point, you want to know if it's gonna, uh, if something gonna fail and um, when that gonna fail so that you can do uh, the most effective uh, predictive um, or the most effective actually maintenance so that you can run your equipment smoothly uh, without downtime. So uh, let's work out an example that how we can implement such a solution. So now let's look at one example and that would be, for example, um, you know, I'm looking into one of the sensor data and assume for the sake of argument, this is a temperature data that I'm um, looking at. If I'm looking into this sensor alone, this doesn't give me any hint why something going to, uh, to fail here. What I need to do in practice is getting kind of uh, you know, extract information that is hidden inside this signal. For example, looking into trends, uh, to, for example, the maximum uh, temperature that this rise or the frequency at which this uh, maximums uh, happening. So if this frequency increasing, for example, and the temperature is rising, rising, then something might go wrong. So what is the problem then with this? The problem is that um, there are many, many different ways that we need to extract information. There are a lot of statistical approach that is available. The point is that we don't know at the outset, what is the best strategy? What is the, you know, um, what are the indicators that I need to extract from this signal? And this becomes a little bit more dramatic when we are looking into how many sensors today are installed in our uh, you know, manufacturing environment. You know, you're collecting many types of you know, data through sensors or vibration or you know, even ambient temperature in that uh, environment, you know, the temperature or pressure or other physical um, you know, um, characteristic from different location of your component. In top of that, now you need to know that what features you need to extract, what indicators you need to extract from these, um, these sensors. So that, in, you know, it ends up, you're, you're with, um, you're, you're end up with thousands and thousands of different uh, new indicators that now you need to process. So now we looked at, you know, a couple of challenges. Let, let's su summarize that. Um, we are dealing with a massive amount of data that we are collecting through, through this uh, sensor data we've just uh, mentioned. We need to be able to predict or answer these questions, these four questions now accurately, you know, um, is something going to fail? What it be, what it will be, when it's going to happen and why? We need to answer that question accurately in order to implement predictive maintenance. We need to have trust on this result. Any system that we design, if it's predicted something going to fail or not, our engineers need to have trust on that. And then we need to be able to deliver that prediction on time. You know, if you're accurate, but after something failed is not also useful. So these are the challenges that we are facing uh, in order to implement a predictive maintenance solution. So it seems that we are introducing more problem than solving problem. But um, the good news here is the AI actually can help us to tackle a couple of these problems. The core part, of, today we're not going too much in details, but the most important part of that is 
and why AI can help it is that you know, there was advancement in AI we've seen in the last couple of years. And what happens or, you know, what is the most important part of it is that machine learning piece where they are good as in a couple of things and the two things that is very good and uh, that also can help us in our problem here in specifically predictive maintenance use cases is these two things. One thing that machine learning is good at uh, when we identify an objective, like, you know, we want to predict uh, if something going to fail or not. When we provide a bunch of data to this algorithm, they are good at identifying which of these data set makes sense to be used. So what is the, which of these signals, or in, in this sense, uh, you know, in this case, uh, the sensor data, which of the sensors carry enough information to be able to predict that information, to and, and predict the, the objective that we have set. So they're good at identifying which uh, signal, which data is useful, which one's not to throw it to throw out. So that's one thing that machine learning is good at. The second thing that machine learning is good at in looking at these all the variables now has been extracted from the sensor data. They're good at looking at those variables at the same time simultaneously to see and find out what is the relation between these variables, which makes sense to be used to do the prediction? Which, you know, we humans typically can look at one variable, two or maximum three. We cannot imagine a four dimensional space. That's why, you know, at the same time, we human can only look at up to three variables, but machine and specifically machine learning is good at looking at those variables simultaneously. So that allows us to, um, you know, this, algorithm to figure out you know, what is the best model or in order to accurately predict whether um, a component is going to fail or not using the data that they're, they're getting uh, from, from these machines. So um, what I'm gonna do today is work out a very concrete example that how H2O platform now allows to apply machine learning to develop a predictive maintenance but before I go in, into that, I'd like to hand over back to Ralph that he can walk us through high level what really uh, H2AR platform is. Back to you, Ralph. Yes, thank you, Asgar. And um, so we are from H2AI, our software vendor, which is considered the most advanced and most visionary machine learning and AI software in the world right now from Gartner mentioned 2020 and also 2021. And we offer um, our software in, an, in a hybrid cloud solution. So you can install it on premise or in a cloud or, or as a combination of both. And basically uh, with our software, you can get a solution which covers the complete end-to-end -end process for predictive maintenance and other use cases. So let me guide you to the six uh, most important steps here. Uh, first of all, you can prepare the data within the platform. You can do adjustments of the data. You can visualize it. You can, uh, you can really see what, what the data is all about. If you have visualized it and load the data, uh, the advanced machine learning and the AI algorithms and all the needed transformation, all the complex stuff, all the complicated math is done to create a very, very accurate model within the platform. And this uh, very accurate uh, AI model is not only available for deployment, you, you have also in parallel the opportunity to get an explanation or an interpretation of the model. So you, you will really understand what the AI model is doing uh, with, an, with a special um, module in the software. So explainability, we call it MLI, interpretability is also part. And as you uh, are completely aware what's going on, you can automatically uh, deploy it. You can uh, deploy it and operate it in a really uh, easy and automated fashion on your embedded devices, on web application, uh, basically on all the, the systems you need to have it. And you can also uh, operate it. So it means uh, the AI models get monitored so you can also have a real-time uh, overview of the behavior of your, of your AI model in, in your environment. And at the end, you have also a, a development tool, a lightweight Python development framework. Uh, with, with this framework, uh, you and your data scientists or, or we for you can develop AI apps 
which makes uh, the AI data models accessible and consumable for your business users. Um, this is very important because uh, the maintenance manager, the manager of a factory, uh, the, the scheduler of the complete maintenance uh, program, they need to have an opportunity to consume all this data. And this is possible with building your own AI apps. Um, and if you build more than one AI app, you can really develop an app store, your own app store for artificial intelligence applications. And for the predictive maintenance use case, Ashkar has prepared a very nice uh, example of how the H2O AI platform is working based on a, on a turbine. So uh, back to Ashkar. All right, so the example that we're gonna work at today to build a predictive maintenance scenario would be is the following. So we are, we are looking into a turbofan engine. Uh, what we are receiving from that is the almost like around 21 sensor data from this engine. And they're basically uh, looking into temperature at various location or pressure, different location. And also, you know, if you know, the speed of fans or some other moving parts in that engine. So now what we want to do with this data and is to use this data and historical, because these are gonna be historical data, using machine learning to be able to figure out, you know, whether a maintenance is required or not. So if you look at into um, this right plot here and horizontal axis, we have the timeline that we're observing this engine and the vertical axis is a health indicator. So the lower is better and if you look at now in this plot, at this stage, we are in okay scenario. So everything all right, everything all right. And at this point, it starts to pick up. The health indicator is rising. So it means that something um, strange happening probably that we need to do maintenance. So we are entering first in a warning zone. So what we want to do now, be able to predict the warning zone so that we can you know, start the process of um, repair or maintenance right at this point. After that, we, if we not be able to do that, we will enter into alarm. Alarm is that, you know, it still is not failed, but, uh, you know, uh, we are also kind of late. We need to hurry up and fail means that any second is going to fail. It's too late to do anything. So what we're going to do now using this data set, applying machine learning, predicting this status of engine. So what I'm going to do now, go live into, let me, Go back here. Okay, so what I've done here is that I built a kind of dashboard. Uh, what it does, it's based on um, Vave is another product in the H2O platform, which allows you um, to build application using Python uh, based on the models that you've built. So what I have here, uh, use, what we are observing here is the status of my engine or equipment in the plant based on the census data that are streamed into this platform. So machine learning now is walking behind the scene to predict the likelihood of whether that engine is going to fail or not, or any engine here. So what we see here is the status, and beside any of the status with the historical health indicator. So health indicator is the summary of all these census data that comes in one number. So what is this, that is, is something gonna fail or not? So what we will now want we want to do with this da dashboard is uh, constantly observing our equipment and their their health status and if something like this happens, warning. Now we want to go and prevent it. So now the question is, how we build the model behind this? So this, um, in order to build a model that is behind this or the brain behind this dashboard, uh, what we need to use now here is the Drawless AI. Drawless AI allows me to build such a model from data end to end, it automates the process in between until the model became available that I can deploy my application or integrating with other solutions that you might have in your organization. The data that I'm gonna use is the sensor data that I've already mentioned. So let's look at data, how it looks like, you know, data, typically sensor data will look like something like this, temperature measurement, pressure me measurement, et cetera. So how machine learning now works, uh, you know, we don't go too much in details today, but in, you know, and in a simple word, what it does, we need to give machines 
historical example that what had happened in the past. So what ma machines now do, does look at this data. So every column here is the sensor data that we're collecting and every row here is the one readings of these sensors. And then on the right, we see that because it's historical data for fact, we know that it was a failure or an okay status. So the machine looks at these examples until some point in the future, so the, the, the machine operates okay, okay, the, then it enters warning. So these are examples of warning condition based on the sensor data data. Now, what machine learning does, looks into these examples, trying to figure out on its own what sensors it needs to, to, to look at and what is the pattern in this sensor data that is in warning and okay or a failure later on. So that we can use now this pattern or this model in future scenario to predict whether something's going to fail or not. All right, so what I'm going to do, I create a, a experiment. So an experiment actually is um, allows me to define first my objective. What is my objective predicting um, at this stage? Basically, is it okay or, or warning or failure? So the next thing I need to do, drop things that I don't have at the time of prediction, like you know, remaining useful life, I don't have it at the time of prediction. I'm gonna drop those information from data set. Otherwise it's gonna be cheating. So now um, I'm good to start an experiment and draw this AI or the machine learning behind it, gonna figure out you know, what features really needed and what transformation are required and prepares it and you know, or builds the model and that, that then, then I can de deploy it. However, before we go into that, there's two things that I'd like to mention. First is that depending on your uh, objectives, like, you know, is interpretability, understanding the models, how important is it? The accuracy, how important is it? So you can get a balance between these settings in order to get a model that, uh, you know, is accurate also, you know, is relevant for your use case. And also if you have an expert data scientist in the organization, uh, they would be able to go and I've just mentioned that, you know, what Jolis AI does is builds your model for you automatically from your data, but your expert data science would be able to influence every steps. So like, you know, if you're having an image data, you know, which data deep learning algorithm you want to apply, et cetera, et cetera. So these can be applied and set uh, um, from the beginning. So what I'm going to do now, I say that, okay, interpretation is not important for me. I want an accurate model. Um, you're going to hit the launch, let Jolis AI build the best model that it can. So what happens at this stage now? <clears throat> so now, Drawless AI receives the data, looks into data, looks if there is anything, um, you know, suspicious in the data. If so, it's gonna report it to me. Now I make sure that everything is all right. And the next stage that it's gonna do is very important. And we mentioned at the beginning that um, it needs to figure out which of the sensor data is relevant and what kind of indicators needs to be extracted from these. And this is the process that is happening as, as it, um, and, and also I mentioned that, you know, what, one thing that machine learning is good at identifying which variables and which uh, data in these scenario sensors are relevant. And this will be reported as it moves on. So at, at this point of time, it, believes that sensor number 11, 4, 12 is the most relevant one um, in order to differentiate between a healthy um, condition and non-healthy condition. This is gonna take for a while. So I'm gonna switch to one that I've already prepared and finished the experiment. And I like to again, highlight the fact that, um, you know, how many features, how many in indicators machine learning behind this system been worked out and extracted from these 21 sensors. And you can see here, here that 5,000 features has been processed or indicators, if you will, if you will been processed by machine learning <coughs> algorithms behind the system. And these indicators doesn't look like from the variables we have seen in the beginning. So it was sensor number one, sensor number two, but you know, you see that they, they have now a different names because they, it's now the combination or these are indicators that have been extracted from original data. And you see that, you know, for example, this one is a combination of variable different sensors is the most important indica indicator to differentiate 
uh, whether something gonna fail or not. And you see here, uh, what, what, what we are looking at this table is actually um, confusion metrics. And confusion metrics tells us um, how good, it is one way to measure how good our algorithm is or the model is to differentiate between um, failure or okay and, and warning in, in that case. And how it works is, is the following. So you have this actual uh, values here. So it's alarm, fail, okay, warning, when it was actually in how many times it was okay and the model predicted it was alarm by mistake, zero. How many times it predicted it was fail, zero. And you see, almost most of the time it was, it was exactly okay, was predicted okay. And the same for, for dress. So that is the, um, you know, that way we can see that how, how accurate our algorithm is. And the fact that it's been able to differentiate between okay and non-okay scenario is, is due to the, you know, how these many features has been worked out uh, through the process. So uh, now that we are confident, okay, the model is accurate, I can put it in use. Now, depending on what is the infrastructure that IT provides in my organization, what is the strategy and policy, or we can go and deploy it either on you know, locally REST API or on deployed on, on the cloud, um, depending on the policy deployment pipeline that IT provides. And it's quite flexible on the way that we can deploy it. Another point that I like to highlight is the fact that, so we have seen that something has been worked out, the model has been built, but all this has been documented in Autodoc so that I can download a Word document. And what the content of the Word document is that it explains to me what happened from the beginning data to building the model, you know, what kind of feature extraction has been applied to, and which ones were important and relevant uh, information and uh, and the next is that you know what kind of algorithm has been applied how it has been um, evaluated and all this information is available as a word doc, doc, document that i can distribute internally or keep as a record um, so um, with this model now we will be able to predict whether something is going to fail and uh, and what's going to fail and when it's going to fail now, I said that at the beginning when I started to speak, you said that, okay, fourth question, I will come to that later. And that is important. And in order to be able to answer the question of why something going to fail, we are entering to machine learning interpretability. So machine learning interpretability allows us uh, to get uh, insights from the model. So if a model uh, you know, makes certain decisions, these interpretability techniques allows us to understand why certain decision has been made. So for example, I will look into, there are different techniques that we can look. Um, I mean, the time doesn't allow us today to go over every details, but one thing that I like to highlight is this, like for example, here's the alarm. In order to predict alarm, the model believes that we need to look at sensor um, four, autocorrelation of sensor four, for, for example, or if you wanna predict, um, Warning, we need to look at this sensor. So this behavior of the sensors um, is relevant to predict these certain things. So that this information can be handed over to our engineers to do to exactly know now what they need to, to do and what needs to be changed. The, the good thing here is that this information can be exposed to your system as well. If you have a maintenance application in place that you want to you know, integrate this information, it would be possible, or like what I did here. Um, added in addition to dashboard another uh, application here beside that that are what I could see now these exactly these details um, it could be like any engine of that I have in in, in that place I can click any in engines here look at the various timeline that you know at this time uh, for example what ha what happened to this engine so what I'm seeing here in, in this plot is the health indicator that we've just spoken about and we are now in this warning zone. Now, what I want to know is that, okay, I know that at this stage it's gonna fail and it's gonna be in the warning zone and that I need maintenance, but why it's gonna fail? So that would be uh, the answer to the why question. The sensor 11 has amplitude maximums, that number that this value can be handed over to engineers and so they can know 
this means and what needs to be done. And also these are the sensor that coming in or streamed into this uh, application that I can also look at the sensors itself. If I important part is this, this piece of information, which will be useful to be used by your um, engineers for doing the maintenance. So uh, that was the one example that how we can stop from data, sensor data to build an application. So now I'm going back now to the slides where we can see now one example that this oil and gas company, what they have done very interesting. So first they've been collecting many, many sensor data but they have not been able to do any prediction or even monitoring. So what they've been doing, they've been collecting data, but many of these uh, maintenance that they have been doing for their ORIG was, um, was manual. But what uh, amazing things that they have been able to do is to leapfrog this um, you know, level in this matrix level, if you're lo looking into, uh, they've been able to leapfrog this level directly into predictive maintenance by applying um, HGIO platform in order to build a model that can predict like, you know, equipment uh, um, failure or a remaining useful life of their equipment. All right, so let's uh, summarize what we have we've discussed today. Um, so we've looked into uh, the challenge that we face today in order to implement a predictive maintenance solution um, and how AI and machine learning can, can be answered to some of these challenges. And we have seen that, you know, uh, by rising many of these sensors and data that we have collecting this massive amount of data and, you know, managing those manually become cumbersome and how automated feature engineering or uh, feature extraction, um, the machine learning provides allows us to manage that size of data. And also how models allows us to build an accurate model that can answer questions like, you know, is something going to fail? what would be and uh, you know at which time and why it's going to fail and by providing the reasons behind why any uh, predictions that um, you know these models um, do by providing this reasons code or these reasons that is available through machine learning interpretability network organization and your engineers can trust these models and put it in an application and put it into into their process and eventually, you know, because the, the, these are models that they will be able to do, um, you know, as we have seen in this dashboard, uh, in the real time, as the sensors come in, uh, they can, sensors comes in, and uh, they, they can basically predict whether something gonna fail or not. And so we can do a maintenance in the right time the right, for the right, uh, with the right component. So that's almost what uh, we wanted to speak about today. And that would be my last slide. So that's now uh, your turn to roll up your sleeves and go in this, you know, at rest, download it and try it for 21 day for free. And also feel free to get, a, to get in contact with us through email or get in touch in LinkedIn and ask if you have any questions or if you have any story to tell us in that space. So with that, I'd like to give it back to Ivan uh, by the way, don't forget to make a screenshot probably from that screen that you make sure that you don't lose your contact. So with that, I'm back to Ivan. Yeah, great. Thanks, Asgar and Ralph. So if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box. We will take some minutes now to answer the questions we already received. So one question uh, maybe for you, Asgar. So what do we need to do and what data do we need to start implementing such a solution? Well, that's a great question. Um, it a little bit depends on what stage a maturity level is uh, typically in, a, in, in an organization to start implementing such a solution. But um, the main point here is that what you need to do is first of all, you need probably a list of your equipment and the type of maintenance that each of these equipments, um, equipments required. So you need to also assess the cost of the maintenance breakdowns or the, you know, any risk that any breakdown could have. You need to have a list of, of those, um, those equipments, maintenance and the evaluation of what would be the cost and what would be the, the, the uh, associated risk if you're not, you know, if, if you're mi mi missing a specific maintenance requirements. So, when you have this information, the next step would be 
um, to you know think about uh, uh, okay so now you know prioritize based on the, the value that you know or the cost savings that any of these uh, maintenance uh, requires and the next thing that you need to think about what you need to do um, to predict or what you need to predict in order to assess the, the, the maintenance so based on the you know what you need to predict you can also assess um, or, or lo look at into how difficult would be to implement that uh, predictive approach. So you don't want to start with the most difficult uh, approach, but you don't also, also start with something that do doesn't have a saving. So you want to probably start with something in the middle that delivers a good ROI and also um, you know, it doesn't take five years to implement so do, that you can build up a momentum. So that's, uh, that's the way typically to start. And, and in, to answer the question, what kind of data you need, you typically need to speak to your experts first that, you know, you know if they wanted to assess what something's working or not, what type of information a, an expert typically re requires. So you want to align in that direction, but also keep in mind that you would never uh, you know, accomplish to a point that you have a perfect data. So you need to have, think of, okay, what is the minimum data that I can start? And what is the minimum model that I can build? And start from there uh, and applying to a use case has the, you know, a good amount of ROI that can put that use case in the map in your organization and, you know, get a buy -in from your executives. That would be a long answer to that question, but hopefully that answers the question. Ashka, I think we, uh, Eve Ann dropped from the Zoom meeting. I cannot see uh, her anymore. So huh. let's, uh, let's maybe go on with a couple of other questions or. Okay, let me see. I can see the, okay. I can also see the question. Maybe I. I saw one question about the, the methods, uh, which are and the algorithms used in, in the software to, to um, generate all the models. So basically we have a huge set of already uh, integrated methods like a neural network uh, and so on, deep learning, NLP, all that stuff is included in the software. But if you have some very special algorithm and transformation, you can even uh, include uh, your own algorithms into the, um, the generating of the AI models. So it's a very flexible um, platform which basically has uh, no limitation from the uh, way of algorithms and transformations you want to use. If Anna is back. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry. I don't know what happened. Um, I lost my connection. I'm really sorry about this. Um, I just no move on with the questions. Maybe I missed a few. I'm really sorry. Um, I can also see question. And one of the questions okay. is that, yeah. How do you deal with equipment that doesn't have a lot of uh, failure data? So that's a really uh, great question because in reality, that's the scenario. So you, hopefully your equipment doesn't fail so often. And um, again, that's another uh, reason why to use automated machine learning because what machine learning is typically trying to do, it, it realizes that, you know, like failure um, is, you have very few data in failure, but you have many okays. So what happens in that scenario is that machine learning approaches try to figure out what kind of strategy is useful to give more weight to, to do rare scenarios. So if you have a, a, you know, you can think of, you know, just giving a weight or, you know, amplitude the effect of that uh, rare scenarios is going to happen by different strategies like replication or some other techniques will be applied to, um, to give just more weight to those um, data set. And the automation that, and this is also one of the areas that when you build an auto ML platform like uh, in HTO, you need to think about those scenarios as well to make sure that you know, your algorithm works in those uh, scenarios as well. And it might be worth mentioning, Asghar, that if you have a really uh, serious interest in running this kind of, uh, predictive maintenance on your data, you can get in touch with us and we can schedule a, a joint proof of concept or uh, guide you with a test drive. So we are really, uh, really open and happy to, 
to support you with the first steps in that in that direction. Mm -hmm. So there is another question that um, that says that okay, this was a super was learning. So uh, that's a great one because if you want to do predictive maintenance, there are a variety of different ways to do it. Um, one way that we've we've discussed called supervised means that we know from historical data, whether it was failure or not, sometimes you don't know whether you don't have this information. You just have a, a sense of data. What typically in, in, in those scenario you would be able to do is anomaly detection. Uh, anomaly detection is would tell you that, for example, um, this sensor doesn't look like the, the behavior that uh, you know I've been seeing in the last couple of hours or, or months or, or years. So then it, it gives you a signal that you know you probably want to look at this um, this in a more details. Another way is that uh, um, you know way to do it to generate these uh, data based on you know in 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 laboratory uh, to to create a labeled data or like applying supervised approach. So what they do they look at into you know. Uh, they intentionally make uh, some part of equipment to fail and you know or, or close being failed and they collect the data uh, based on a variety of different measurements and try to build based on uh, laboratory data so th that's also another way that um, I've seen that industries apply we have a lot of other questions Ivan should we should we Go for two more or three. We still have a few minutes, so we can take a few more questions. I'm just going through the list. So I can see accuracy is key, uh, one of the questions, yes. So of course, accuracy is really uh, maybe the most important, a very important uh, goal to achieve. And we need to say that our software is really, really uh, generating very accurate model. So we have some customers with accuracies high above 90 percent and if you compare that to any other uh, accuracies you can uh, do with other machine learning tools or or, or manually uh, you can expect a very very high accuracy um, out of our uh, platform that's maybe un that but it needs to be it needs to be proven right so if you have already an existing system and you want want to do a cross check on accuracy we are also very happy to do that but you can expect an extremely high accuracy from our platform. There was two or three questions about accuracy, so I thought it may be worse. <laughs> what else do we have? Um, so how will the software be linked or will it communicate um, with the machine that's receiving the data for receiving the data? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, this, you know, we can take this from to a perspective because um, using machine learning or you know, the application that we have seen, it, it's two stages. One stage is to build the models, like you need to get the data. And typically in that scenario, you have, you're storing your data in your um, you know, data center. And you know, there are a variety of different uh, connectors that you can connect to your data centers. And the second, uh, you know, or different ways to look at it is that when at the second stage, you want to deploy this model now into your production environment to do the predictions. And in, in that way, you know, what, um, what I just mentioned uh, during the, de the demonstration that when a modeling part is finished, you can um, also deploy or get your uh, model as an artifact and deploy it wherever, you know, if you want to deploy it closer to your sensor data or whatever the application that collects this uh, sensor data, install it there. Or if, you know, the REST API would work for you, 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 you can deploy it also as a REST API. And, you know, but every application that collects this sensor data can call now the REST API and do the prediction. There is really different ways to implement that. It highly depends on the um, IT environment or the, the architecture that you are put in place. So this needs to be a little bit looked into more details to come up with the, with the right answer because Travelis AI or uh, H2A our platform is flexible in the way that we can deploy models. Great. Um, well, thank you, um, Ralph and Asghar for taking the time today and thank you to everyone who joined us.
We would love to get your feedback on this webinar and the next topics you would like us to cover. So please answer the quick survey that will show up after we close the event. Um, also, we received a lot of questions. We couldn't answer all of them today, but feel free to reach out to us if you would like to continue the conversation. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. Stay tuned for upcoming events and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Bye.